So if you missed last week, I started a new sermon series. We're in week two here of a four-part sermon series. It's going to be called, uh, I Want to Believe in God, But, right? Um, There are so many people, and I, once upon a time, I used to be one of these people. There's so many people that that kind of want to believe. They'd like to be God followers, they, want to, they, they do, in fact, probably believe in some kind of God, that there at least is a God, but there's some sort of ceiling, there's some sort of barrier, there's something, something going on, some reason why they just can't fully believe. They can't just step over that line in, in becoming a Christian. And, and, and what I want to argue, and I know this from my own experience, is that many of these people are not actually rejecting the one true God, but they're rejecting a, a, a false idea of who God is. And if we get down to the core of who God actually is in His pure essence, um, I think many of their, their objections would be resolved and removed, and, and, and we would eliminate this distorted view of God that they have. And it would give them an opportunity to see God for who He truly is, uh, and quit rejecting God for this wrong view that they hold. And so that's what this sermon series is about. And, and uh, the idea is, hopefully this will equip you. Maybe this will speak to you. Maybe you have these doubts, or you've had these doubts in the past. Or maybe in the days and weeks and months to come, you'll encounter somebody with these doubts, and it will give you a chance to have uh, a conversation with them about it. And what I want to talk about today, and, and what we're going to dig into today, is, is one that very, hits very close to home for me personally. And it's a talk about what I would like to call a killjoy God. Uh, you know, I want to believe in God, but there are just, there's too many rules, Pastor. I mean, I, I want to believe in God, but I don't want to be boring, right? I, I don't want to be a dud that, I, you know, pastor, I, I'd consider being a Christian, but I'd, I really want to enjoy life. That doesn't look very fun. You know, I, I, I wanted to be a Christian, but there's, these, there's all these do's, there's all these don'ts. How can I keep up with all of them? And, and back when I was a Christian, the other one I experienced was, I see all these do's, I see all these don'ts, and when I don't do, and when I don't don't, when I'm supposed to, then, then all these Christians judge me, right? And make me feel bad about myself. And if we're really honest, I mean, if we look at it and we're truthful, and this is a safe space where we can be honest and truthful. When I was not a Christian, and I, I looked at Christians... There was a whole bunch of them I just didn't like. Is that okay to say out loud in church? There, there was a bunch I just didn't like. I mean, there, you know, there were some Christians. I had some good Christian men and women, some really great Christian friends. I, I had the fortune of growing up one of my best friends. His dad was the president of a seminary, so God was always around me. But, but there was a lot of Christians, so to speak, in my life that seemed to be snotty, hypocritical, judgmental, holier than thou. And a bunch of them claimed one thing, but did something else, right? How, how could I become that? Then if I'm really honest, like I said, the ones who were really living out their faith, I looked at and thought, no, nah, that looks boring, Right? I mean, in fact, growing up in the 80s and 90s, if, if you understood my view, when I looked at the Christian guys around me, the guys who I thought you know, were the, the typical model Christian guys, these were the guys wearing the penny loafers, the khaki pants, the braided belts. Remember those braided belts? They had the, they had the, the Star Wars shirt that said, May His Force Be With You, right? That, that kind of thing. And I just couldn't be that guy. I mean, I wanted to believe in God. I mean, I believe God existed. But there was all these rules, regulations, and I, I just couldn't get there, man. And some people say, I want to believe in Him, but with all those rules, what's the benefit anyway? I mean, my life seems to be going pretty good, Pastor. Why, why should I follow this God who tells me to do this and tells me don't do that? And, and that's going to get in the way of what I want to be doing. And so with that as the backdrop and mindset, that's a lot of the world we, we all encounter these people at work, at school, at home, and our families and friends and everybody. I'd like to unpack these ideas a little bit today and talk about two things, the good news and the bad news about Jesus and religion. And we're going to start with the bad news first. 
If anybody ever asks you, do you want the good news first or the bad news first? Take the bad news first. All right? You want to end on a high note. So we're going to start with the bad news first. And I hope that when you hear me say this, that you'll understand, when I say the term religion, I'm not talking about Christianity. When I use the word religion, what I'm referring to is man-made rules to try to please God. And see, there's a, there's a difference between Christianity and, and, and just general religion. And I want to talk first about the bad news, as I said, about religion. And then I'm going to talk about the good news about Jesus, if that's okay. And if you're taking notes today, here is the bad news about religion. Religion focuses on the external rather than on the internal. See, it focuses on the external rather than the internal. If you've ever looked at somebody and, and said, you're, you're, you're claiming one thing, but you're not really living that, right? That's kind of hypocritical. That's exactly what Jesus was saying in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 23, 25 through 26. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the pews, iPhones, Android, whatever you got, go to the U version. Great website, uh, uversion, Y-O-U version. Dot, uh, it's at thebible.com is where it's at. But U version's a great app. Um, and we're going to be in Matthew 23, 25 through 26 for a moment. And, and, and Jesus there is talking about the external and, and how when I'm more concerned about that than what is internal. And, and Jesus experienced this very problem. Jesus, Jesus says this. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean up the outside, you clean up the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside it's filthy, right? It's full of greed and self-indulgence. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're putting on this religious show on, on the outside, but it doesn't match up with your heart. Then he goes on into verse 26 and he says, blind Pharisees, First, you need to deal with the inside. He says, you got it in the wrong order, folks. He says, you need to clean the inside, and then the outside will become clean as well. What does religion do? Religion focuses on the external rather than the internal. And here's what many people wrongly assume about God. Let's take the, the holiness of God and say, you know, no, here, here's the holiness of God, and, and here is unholy me, right? And somehow, I need to get there, where the holiness of God is from where I am. You know, in other words, if, if God is holy and I'm not, that means at some point I have done wrong. I, I haven't always done what was right. How do I bridge that? How do I, how do I make that come together? How, how do I get closer to God? And many of us, that is our pursuit. And so we, we with our, our human effort, we, we, we try to close this gap to God. We try to, try to reduce maybe our sinfulness. We try to get closer to God's holiness. And we do this by trying harder, right? By trying to be better, by doing religious things. If I go to, if I, if I go to more Christian concerts, if I read more Christian books, if I, if I spend more hours inside of the four walls of the church, truly, surely I must be closer to God then, right? And I don't know what religious rules you've experienced in your life and what ones you've even maybe adopted, but I grew up going to church, you know? Um, I, I was that drug kid. I was drugged to church every week, right? I, I, my family was always in church. I, my not being a Christian when I was younger was not my family's fault. They, they, you know, they were constantly bringing me to church, constantly putting me in front of it, constantly giving me the opportunity. So, so that's on me. But uh, we, we, we get to this point where we've adopted some rules and maybe we're, we're doing okay in life and things are working okay for us and... You know, we, we follow the big ones, right? You know, the big ones are, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chew, right? And you don't, gir- you don't date girls that do. That's important. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't date girls that do. You could get that as a tattoo. It'll rhyme. Anyhow. Um, but there's some things we all, you know, a lot of us, we say, yeah, we're not going to do those things. And, and because we want to look good. 
We want to have that outward appearance. If we do these things or we don't do these things, then, then maybe I'll be right with God. You know, we're trying to close that gap with God. We're trying to, trying through our human effort to get closer to God. But Jesus said, don't be like the Pharisees. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. You see, these Pharisees, they were the, the, the bigwig religious dudes of their day. They were the influencers in their religious circles back at the time of Jesus. And what they would do is they would go around putting on these big religious shows. They would go out on the street corner, right? In very public places in Jerusalem. And they'd pray. But it wasn't like, you know, Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. No, it was like, Jesus, look at me! I am in need of your love and your grace. And, and they would pray these big, loud prayers. And, and then they would have this garb. They would wear these robes with special tassels that were supposed to make them look more holy. And, and they'd have things tied around their heads and, and scrolls of Scripture on their arm. And none of this is bad necessarily. But they were doing this as a, as a show so people would see that they appeared to be holy. But then, when they weren't being watched by the public, they were taking advantage of innocent widows. They were lying to people. They were heaping all these rules on top of people. You've got to do this. You can't do that. You've got to obey the Sabbath. You shouldn't be hanging out with that person. You shouldn't be like this. It was all about the external for them. Let me give you a little history lesson that will maybe help you uh, understand this, bring some understanding to why it was this way. If you go back to this time where we've been studying Babylon and Daniel and, and Ezra and Haggai and, and Esther in the fall, if you go back to this time, a little bit after that, during the time of Nehemiah, here's what happened. The religious leaders of the time, they, they, they looked around and they said, look at all these people breaking God's laws. We're not doing a very good job. Our history shows us the Israelites were knuckleheads. And maybe we could do something to help people not sin so much, right? So what we're going to do? I think we're going to come up with some new laws. Some extra laws. We're going we're to create some boundaries, some borders, some guardrails to keep people in line. And so they created some laws. So... Laws that would help you not break God's laws. And those laws, of course, as we're talking about, those are called the Torah. You find those in the first five books of the Bible. And, and so they say, we're going to come up with some man-made laws just to make sure you're extra safe religiously. And what these well-intentioned religious leaders did is they came up with over 600 brand new laws that became known as fence laws, right? Fences help keep you in, keep you protected, keep you safe. That's what you do with your animals, right? And these laws are going to protect the Torah. They're going to keep us pure and clean as the people of God. These laws were so intense that there were 65 different laws just for the Sabbath alone. So every Saturday, because you were Jewish, there were 65 laws you had to keep if you wanted to be clean enough to be able to go to temple. And we know this because later on these were compiled into a book, an 800 long, page long book of these laws and rules called the Mishnah. These man-made laws, not God-given laws. And this is why Jesus was so passionate. And he says this in Matthew 23, 3-4. He says, don't follow the examples of the Pharisees, for they don't practice what they preach. What do they do? He says they crush people with unbearable religious demands and they never lift a finger to ease that burden. If you've ever thought, I, I want to believe in God, right? But there's so many rules and regulations. And that's oppressive. All these, all these do's and all these don'ts. I want you to hear me. That is not a reflection of the heart of God. That is what people have added to what God has already established. It's additional works, trying to close that gap between me and God. And it doesn't reflect the heart of God. Anytime you think of the killjoy God, I want you to remember that God does not exist. 
God wants you to have joy and experience life in abundance. And the, the laws that God gave us, the laws that God gave us are not given to us to confine us, but to free us. To have fully the life that He wants us to live. As I said, we're going to get to the good news of Jesus, but we're going to plow through some other information here for a little bit. And if you stick with me, I think there's a payoff today. I, I promise it'll be good if you get there with me. Look at Romans 3:20 20 through 22. These are my key verses for the day. Romans 3:20 20 through 22. You'll see them on the screen as well. We're going to look at these three verses primarily for the rest of our time. And, and they may seem maybe a little confusing at first, but we're going to break that down. Uh, I'm going to try to make it easy for you to digest so that you understand it. Uh, maybe put some maple syrup or something on it so it tastes good. Or uh, I'm just joking. But uh, uh, this is what the scripture says in Romans 3:20 20 through 22. It says, therefore. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. What is the good news about Jesus? Well, let's break it down into three very simple thoughts. The first one, if you're taking notes, is is this. This is important. You cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. No matter how hard you try, no matter how good you are at being religious, no matter how many good works you might possibly do, no matter how many bad things you might possibly avoid, you cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. Religion says... Your good works will please God. But the scripture, the Bible teaches, you cannot be good enough to please God. The rules may be, go to church, don't do bad, do this, don't do that, right? Here's what scripture says. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. No one, not one. And it doesn't matter what kind of church you go to, how holy you act, How good of a show you might put on or how hard you try, you cannot be good enough to please God by your works. You cannot please God by just doing works of the law. It's impossible. So that raises the question. Why then, God, did you give us these laws? Right? If I can't live up to your your, your standard, why did you give us the law in the first place? That leads us to the second thought. There's a payoff here. Number two, the purpose of the law is to show that you need a Savior. Look at verse 20. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. So why is there the law? Rather, he says, through the law we become conscience, conscious of our own sin. Through the law we get to see that we are broken. That's specifically why it's so important. Why we have to understand this. And why we need to spend a few moments on it today. Because there's this this common belief that people would say, you know, I'm really not that bad of a person, right? Especially not when I measure myself against other people. Is this a bell curve? Is this a sliding scale? I'm not that bad of a person, pastor. I'm a pretty good person most days. I mean, yeah, I'm good Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Don't, don't, don't look at those. But Monday through Friday, i got five out of seven. I mean, if we're playing baseball, that's a pretty good batting average, right? God's got to like me then. Isn't that how this works? And that's a very commonly held belief. I held that belief once that, well, yeah, I, I just don't have to be as bad as that guy or that lady. But I'm a pastor, and i got to tell you the truth. You're a sinner. And you're like, hey, don't judge me, pal. Who are you to judge me? I'm usually not a sinner. And this is why the law is so important, folks. Because it actually shows us that every single one of us, me too, especially me, we're all sinners. But pastor, I'm really not that bad of a person. Well, yeah, maybe compared to some other folks, you might not be that bad of a person. But you see, uh, compared to the standard of God, 
We all fall incredibly short. You might have heard of this guy before, and actually two guys. The well, first one's a guy by the name of Ray Comfort. Um, you may have heard of Ray Comfort. If not, um, uh, what's a, the other guy's a f- last, uh, Todd Friel. Used to be a guy in the Twin Cities, moved to California to work with Ray Comfort. And, and I used to listen to Todd on the radio all the time when he was in the Twin Cities back when I was in seminary. And, and uh, he, he uses this Ray Comfort model. And they ask this series of questions and does kind of this interview thing. And so, so he would go uh, and, and go like to the city park or he would go to a school or he would just go wherever some people might be, maybe at the mall. And he would do this interview thing and just say, hey, can I ask you a few questions? And, he, and, and we're recording this and they'd have a microphone or it'd be live on the radio sometimes. And he would say, hey, let me ask you a few questions. So I'm going to ask all of you a few of these questions today. And if you're willing, raise your hand if this is true of you, okay? Are you ready? Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever told a lie? All right, raise that hand up, right? Raise it up a little higher. Leave them up if you will. Yeah, put them up there, put them up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the people who aren't raising their hands right now, look at them and say, you're a liar. <laughs> Santa is checking his list. He's making, okay, maybe not. But we've all lied. Right? We, we're all liar, liar, pants on fire, all of us. We've all, every single one of us, at some point, told a lie. How many of you have ever, uh, and this might be a little bit more embarrassing, but raise your hand. How, how many of you have ever stolen something? I have. Yeah, I, I've stolen something. I have. Yeah, leave them up for a minute there so we, so we know who not to trust. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But how many of you, you've stolen a bank pen or three? How many of you wrote a tithe check today with a stolen bank pen? (laughs) Repent sinners. Most of us have stolen though, right? Well, here's another one. How many of you have ever lusted? Raise your hand. Yeah? Yeah? Lust? Lust? Woo! Yeah. Some of the guys are like, you're right. Yeah, put your hand down. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Or maybe you're like, I'm lusting right now. Uh, but we've lusted, right? And, and the thing we need to understand is, Jesus says in the Bible, that anyone who's looked lustfully at somebody, they've actually committed adultery in their heart. And it's hard for us to understand that. But that's the standard that Jesus says. It's, he says, if, if I let my eyes linger a little too long, if my mind starts to wonder about that, that young woman or that beautiful guy, that's just the same as if I had committed a much greater physical sin with him. As far as the sin, as far as the heart goes, it's the same problem. Because the standard of God is so much higher than our standard, folks. He says, even if you look lustfully, just barely, just for a moment, just too long, you've lusted You've sinned. Now, as we've determined, you all are a bunch of lying, thieving adulterers, right? A bunch of smelly, stinking sinners today. In fact, I would say you're all wretched. You're pathetic. You're unrighteous. You're unholy. Welcome to Glory Baptist Church, where we make you feel good about yourself. I'm so glad you came today. And I don't want to be harsh or critical. I don't want to make you feel bad. I I am among the chief of sinners. But let me tell you why it's so important. Because when we go through life saying, yeah, I'm not that bad of a person. When we do that, we don't recognize that we have the need for forgiveness. That we have the need for the goodness of God. This is how I see it. Until you see yourself as a sinner, you won't see a need for a Savior. And that's why we have to start here. Until you see yourself as a sinner, you won't understand that you have a need for a Savior. Until you know you have cancer, you don't know you need an operation or chemo. Right? Until you know you're broken, and you can't fix that brokenness. And in fact, you're just going to keep contributing to that brokenness. Until you understand that, you're never going to realize... I can't fix that brokenness. I need somebody. And this is what the good news of the gospel is about. The good news of the gospel is we, we cannot be good enough for God. 
There is no person who can, form their, who can perform their way into in God's good graces. Because all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. All of us have not reached the standard that the law shows us. What's the purpose of the law? The law is to show us that we are not good enough. That we need grace. That we need mercy. That we need help. So, you cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. And then the law is simply to show you that you need a Savior. And then the third thought, if you're following along, and this is where the good news really comes. <coughs> Being right with God comes through faith in Christ alone. The way that we're made right with God is not religious works. It's not by trying harder, but it's by trusting in the perfect work of Jesus and that alone. This is why Paul said in verse 22, he said, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. To whom? To all who believe. See, hear me on this. It does not matter how bad your past was. I don't care how big of a sinner you were. I don't care how many lies, how many stealing, how much lust, and how many other things that you've done. I don't care what your past looks like. I've had people say, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is what Jesus has done. It's not about you and what you did. It's not about your past or your future as far as your works. It's about Jesus Christ. And when you put your faith in Christ, your sins are forgiven. And you can be made complete and be fully restored in relationship with God. You don't need religion. You need Christ and Christ alone. Not Christ plus religious effort. Not Christ plus anything. Christ and Christ alone. And this is why I love the power of the story of Jesus on the cross. See, if you're not a church person, and most of you are, but you know, I'm going to review the story for you. Anyhow, Jesus, when he was crucified, he's put up on a cross. He's nailed to a cross. And along with him were, were two other scoundrels who deserved to be there. Two other, two other criminals. And one of the other criminals looked upon Jesus with a, with a contrite, sad, broken heart. The other one was making fun and mocking Jesus. If you're really Jesus, why don't you get us down off of these crosses, buddy? Right? The other guy's like, hey pal, knock it off. We deserve to be up here. He doesn't. And this other guy goes, hey Jesus, you know, if you just remember me, you know, um, when, you, when you go into your kingdom, if you, could, if you could just remember me, right? I'd appreciate it. Jesus looked back at him. And gave him the assurance and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. And you're like, wait, what? What do you mean? He's on a cross. He was a criminal. He was, he was put on the cross because he had broken laws and deserved, according to their laws, to be executed. Sentenced to death in the most horrific of ways, crucifixion. So could this guy up on a cross, who's already nailed there, he's stuck in the ground, can he do any good that day? Can he do some good works? Maybe he will get baptized quick, right? And that'll, that'll get him into heaven, won't it? Uh, maybe if it rains, he'll get wet. But no. His hands were bound to the cross. Not a lot of opportunity there to turn over a new leaf. He couldn't get down. He couldn't go to the synagogue and make an offering. There's no way, right? Well, not if it's according to his works. But it's faith in Christ alone. And Jesus said to him, Today, today you'll be in paradise with me. So how does that work? Because we have sinned. What Jesus does is he takes his perfection, he covers us with it. And this is so beautiful. See, you know, imagine if you've read the scarlet letter, remember she had to wear that scarlet A. You ever seen a NASCAR race car driver and they got all the labels on their jackets that say, you know, Mobile and Budweiser and whatever their advertisements are that they make money from, right? Imagine if you had to wear a suit every day that said, liar, thief, 
adulterer, gossip, philanderer, all your sins. You know, you get to wear a jacket that said that. Just imagine that. I won't make you go home and sew one or anything, but imagine what that would look like. And when God sees you, that's what God sees. God sees that mess. And Jesus comes along and says, Hey, I got a spotless coat. There's no sin on it. No sin will stick to it. I'll put it over you. So when God looks at you, He doesn't see your coat. In fact, not only that, I'm going to take your old coat off and I'm going to take it for you. We're going to put this new, clean, white jacket on you that doesn't have any sin. That's what Jesus does. He covers us. He gives us His righteousness, takes our sins. This is the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is all about performance, performance, performance. Christianity is about the perfect work of Jesus. Religion is all about what I do, what I do, what I do. Religion says, if I try harder, if I just do more, then maybe God will love me. Christianity says, because God loves me, and I'm accepted in Christ, I will choose to obey and follow His ways. Anytime someone says, maybe you've had this experience, maybe it's you, I don't want to follow God because He's here to kill all my joy. There's too many rules, there's too many regulations, He doesn't want me to have fun. We need to understand that man-made religion has complicated what God made simple. That wasn't God's way. That wasn't what He wanted for us. Think all the way back to the time of Adam and Eve. Right? Early parts of Genesis. God creates the garden. It is good. God created Adam. It's pretty good. God created Eve. It was good. And Adam was even better because of Eve. Right? And then they're, they're given some, some work. Be fruitful, multiply, have fun, subdue the land, name the animals, plant some crops. Enjoy this. That's what God says. Be blessed. This is paradise. But there's one thing, just, just one rule. One don't. Everything else was go and have fun. But one thing, that one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil over there, don't eat its fruit. If you do that, you will surely die. But otherwise, be fruitful, have fun, enjoy life, rejoice. Be free. Go name that giraffe, that monkey, that turtle, that pig, right? you got a lot of work to do. Go for it. Just don't do the one thing. So why did God tell them not to eat of the fruit of that one tree? To keep them from doing all of the other fun stuff? No. He wasn't trying to keep them away from all the things that were good that He had blessed them with. He was trying to keep them from the one thing that would steal their life. He'd given them all this freedom and all of these blessings. And what does religion do? Religion complicates it. It adds to that. God said, here's all the great stuff and just don't do this. And we go, well, let's add to that and make it more complicated. Psalm 16, which is known as the Golden Psalm. David says this. David says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I love that. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, right? I've got freedom on this side of the boundaries. See, before I was a Christian, I looked at other people who were Christians, and I'm like, yeah, that doesn't look like so much fun. But eventually, all the fun that I thought I was having when I wasn't a Christian, it soon started to not be so much fun anymore. It got old, it got tiring, it got painful even at times. I was unhappy. I was miserable. And all of a sudden, the good news of the gospel came to me through some of my friends. And they said, no, following Jesus isn't a bunch of rules, it's a relationship. And it's freeing. I don't have to obey the boundaries or the laws to please God. But I do so because of His grace to me. See, religion complicates with laws. Jesus simplifies with love. Let me say that again because it's our closing thought. Religion complicates with laws. Jesus simplifies with love. One time a, a religious person would say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? 
What's the most important one? I mean, because there was, there was a lot of laws back in his day. Jesus, what's, what is most important? And Jesus said, above all else, the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with everything in you, with your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor just as you love yourself. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. We have 600 laws, Jesus. What do you mean? Don't I have to do all that? No. No, no. Love God. Love others. Religion complicates with law. Jesus simplifies with love. That is so important. So many people walk around in this world today saying, I don't want that God. He's got a bunch of rules for me. No. That God has a bunch of love for you. Hear me today on that. We can't obey God. We can't jump through enough hoops. We can't do enough on our own. I will never be good enough on my own because I am a sinner in need of a Savior. But then when I call out to the one who paid it all, God will hear my prayers. I can and will be forgiven and I will be clothed with his righteousness. So my only reasonable response then is to give it all to him, the one who gave it all for me. Religion complicates what God made simple. Religion complicates with the law, but Jesus simplified all of it with his love. Let's pray.